So our next section, which will hopefully last most of the rest of this week, we'll start to go through a summary of key C++ capabilities. As we've talked about before, C++ is a very vast language, and so we can't hope to cover every nook and cranny of it. In some sense, that would probably be a mistake anyway, because uh, it would get us down rat holes that we don't need to go down. But I want to really focus on the key elements that C++ provides, and then we'll look at lots of examples. So as you recall, we talked about the fact that C++ is a multi-paradigm language, and it supports a number of styles. It supports uh, certainly procedural programming, and it does it by improving upon what's available with C in terms of things like type checking and in terms of data abstraction. It also then supports object-oriented programming, which is really, like I said the other day, where it got its initial fame. But the main thing that C++ does these days is it supports generic programming. And that's the cat's meow as far as the cool things that C++ does. And the reason why it's the cat's meow is it's, it's very generalizable and very extensible, but it also is straightforward. Well, not straightforward. It's also possible to be optimized very heavily, thereby allowing C++ to continue to claim victory in the lightweight abstractions category that maps directly to the hardware. So we're going to kind of expand that box a little bit. And for right now, I'm going to give you a lightning tour through each of these capabilities. And then we'll go through each one of them in more detail and look at lots of examples. So here we're going to look primarily just to kind of orient you and give you the, the big picture view. And then we're going to dive in deep in each one of them. So I think I mentioned the other day, one of the things that C++ was intending to do right from the start was provide better type checking than what was available in C. And it's, it's hard to remember these days, but back when, when I started programming, which was in the, the mid 80s or so, uh, a lot of people used C because computers weren't very powerful back in those days. And so as a consequence, they needed to use a language that was fairly close to the, to the hardware, if you will. And, and C fit that bill. But C had all kinds of weird quirks. For example, in C, you could define a function and you could leave out the, the type parameters and then you could make calls. In fact, let me, let me tweak this a little bit because it really should be like this. You could write C code like this where you didn't give any parameters to the function declaration and then you could call it with other parameters and the compiler wouldn't really check to see if if you were doing it incorrectly. It didn't do type checking, especially across compilation units, which was insane. <laughs> so that was one of the first things that C++ added was support for so-called function prototypes to make sure that you matched things correctly. And then we also talked about a whole bunch of relatively, in retrospect, somewhat esoteric topics, but you could uh, go back and forth between pointers to void and pointers to int and pointers to doubles and pointers to functions in C without explicitly demonstrating your intent. And the compiler just kind of assumed you knew what you were doing and would let all kinds of erroneous code creep in to the code base in ways that really could not easily be checked. There was a tool called Lint, which it still exists, and it was meant to pick the fluff off your C code. But at the time, Lint had a lot of false positives, so a lot of people didn't actually run it because it would generate so many things that weren't errors that people would just get overwhelmed with the output. So C++ has great improvements in terms of static type checking. Now, C++ is not a completely statically type checked language. There's a few little corner cases where you can let things slip through. But relative to C, it's a heck of a lot better. And I think for the most part, type errors are pretty uncommon in C++ code, especially if you or a sophisticated advanced C++ programmer using the newer features that we're gonna talk about shortly. So I'm not gonna say much more about strong data typing. That's kind of taken for granted nowadays with certain categories of languages, languages like Java, for example, languages like C Sharp, languages like C++. There, of course, are a whole other category of languages, JavaScript being one of the most uh, good examples of that, that decided that dynamic typing is the way to go. And uh, the, the old cliche people used to say back in the day, strong typing is for weak minds. Uh, so in these languages, they, they really don't attempt to do any kind of strong type checking in the core language, although there's things like TypeScript that provide a stronger type system around JavaScript. 
Um, for various reasons that I only partially understand, perhaps uh, programmer job security, these languages have become enormously popular, especially for developing web pages. And the sad part is I really think it's a huge step backwards in software productivity and software quality, but that's beyond the scope of this discussion to argue that point. So we'll just say that C++ and Java and C Sharp fall under the strongly, more strongly typed language categories as opposed to languages like, like uh, JavaScript, which don't. The next set of things that C++ provides as part of its multi-paradigm language capability uh, could still be looked, uh, well, this is, this is the, the data abstraction and encapsulation portion of object-oriented programming. So object-oriented programming itself has its own dimensions, and one of them is data abstraction and encapsulation. That's kind of the building blocks of object-oriented programming. And these include features in C++ that hopefully you know and love, like classes, like access control specifiers, namespaces, and so on. And what I show you on the right-hand side is, is a very simple example of this. This is kind of C++ uh, circa 1988 or so, um, shortly after I had started programming with it. And in those days, we didn't have parameterized types, but we did, in fact, have the concept of data abstraction, and we could use these capabilities nicely. I just noticed there's a little typo here. Let me fix that so it doesn't persist anymore. And uh, so basically, this is an example of a classic C++, you know, sort of first generation feature set using data abstraction. So you can see that we have a stack, and we type def the type of stack, so we can have a stack of t, which in this case is int. That's not bad. It, we'll see how to improve it in a minute. And then we can define a bunch of methods. We have the so-called big three methods, the copy constructor, the assignment operator, and the destructor. And we also have a constructor that takes a size and makes a stack of that size. And then we've got methods like push and pop and top and is empty and, and is full. And we'll talk more about those in a second. Um, when we get into the details of this. And then we have something, and those are all public methods. That's the public access control specifier portion of the stack class. Uh, for those of you who come from a Java background, unlike Java where you have to encode every single method with its type unless you want to make it package private, you have to, in C++, you only have to give an access control specifier and then everything up to you change the specifier has that property. Down at the bottom, you can see that we have the so-called private part of the class where we define a couple of fields, data members, a top and a size, as well as a pointer to the stack. So this is going to be a dynamically allocated stack. And I'm not going to evaluate this at the moment. We'll come back later and talk about it in more detail and critique it. But at a high level, that's kind of the features that we've got with that era of C++. With the introduction of C++ 2.0, there came this concept of templates. And you can see here what we're doing is we're generalizing. Rather than using type def, which meant we had to change that physically every time we wanted to have a different stack, which was a royal pain, now we're able to use this template concept. And what templates allow us to do is they allow us to generalize over type. So everything else here is pretty much the same, except that now we're generalizing over type. So anywhere we used to have type def int t, we're now saying template type name t, and now the compiler can automatically do the type checking, do the synthesis of the various instantiations that are based on the types we give it. And this example doesn't really go into that yet. I'm just showing you the structural parts. So this is an example of parameterized classes. We'll also see later that you can have parameterized functions. And in fact, parameterized functions are crucially important for C++ and its standard template library. That's really the part of the essence of, of STL, our parameterized functions, and parameterized classes too. So you can see this doesn't really change a lot of things in terms of the syntax, at least not in the declaration part. The actual bodies of these methods will change, but this is very similar. We're just generalizing. So that's, that's the generic programming concept. And there's a lot more to it than this, of course. I'm just giving you the preview. Another thing that you could do with C++, and I think this might have been C++ 3.0, I forget exactly the time frame, but 
they started putting support in the language for exception handling. And what that meant was that now you could actually have exceptions in your code that you could raise or throw and you could catch. And the whole idea here was to decouple the normal processing flow in your application when things don't go wrong with the exceptional or error handling flow through your code. And that turns out to be really important. And we'll talk a lot more about that later. What was interesting was when this concept first came out, the C++ exceptions, people were really flummoxed on how to use it correctly. And I can remember in the mid to late 90s, even at that time, we were still very befuddled as to how to write proper exception safe code. That has now been fixed in terms of understanding the patterns and the idioms of exception safety. And we'll talk quite a bit about that later. But the main difference between exception-based code and non-exception-based code is if something goes wrong with exception-based code, you can make sure that you have to deal with it. Or you can make somebody have to deal with it. Before exceptions came along, the way of dealing with errors was to typically return error values from methods or from member functions. The problem, there are two problems. Number one, you couldn't deal with constructor errors very effectively without doing wacky things like returning uh, reference error codes or pointer error codes in the parameter list of the constructor. And that was god awful. Uh, or you just had to make sure everybody checked the calls and got the return values instead of saw if they were failure return values or not, which really wasn't any better than programming in C at some level. So adding exception handling to C was a very important step forward, but it didn't come without headaches. And so a lot of this course is going to teach you the patterns and idioms to do exception handling properly. This particular piece of code just takes a snippet of our stack and you can see it defines some nested classes, one called underflow and one called overflow. And then we update the push and pop methods to basically go ahead and check to see if the stack is full. And if it's full, when we try to push, we throw the stack overflow exception. And if the stack is empty, when we're trying to pop, we go ahead and throw the underflow exception. And we'll talk a lot more about this later when we get into the exception portion of the, of the class. But the key point there is, if the stack is empty and you try to pop, you get an exception. If the stack is full and you try to push, you get an exception. And you've got to deal with this exception somehow or else your program will die uh, a death of, of going down in flames because it'll basically exit with uh, an unhandled exception handler. And that's actually very similar to the way that things work in Java as well. So the last, well, next to last topic I'm going to cover here, if there's one more topic in the overview, is oddly enough what made C++ famous in the first place, which was object-oriented programming. And the key concepts and the key features that are important there are abstract classes, often called abstract base classes, inheritance, and virtual methods or virtual member functions. I like to use the word virtual method, but virtual method and virtual member function are synonymous from my point of view. And the basic idea here is you could define something called an abstract base class, like I'm showing you here, where you could say, I'm going to define an interface, but I'm not going to actually define the implementation. I'm going to let that be defined by subclasses or so-called derived classes in C++. Oftentimes in, in the world of the small talk Java tradition, we call these superclasses and subclasses. In the Simula C++ tradition, we call them base classes and derived classes. They mean the same thing. And I may, I may stumble and go back and forth in my terminology, but just be aware that derived class is the same thing as a subclass, and a base class is the same thing as a superclass. That's one of the dangers of being you know, multilingual. You, you get confused and use the slightly different terms that mean the same thing. OK, so what you're doing here is we're just defining an interface for the stack. You can see we have virtual methods, and we make those methods be um, what are called pure virtual. And what that means is that they don't actually have to have an implementation. Oddly enough, the destructor needs to have an implementation, even if you make it pure virtual, for reasons that we'll talk about later. Uh, but uh, the other methods are simply defined with the equal zero at the end, and that means that they intentionally do not have an implementation. You can actually implement a pure virtual method, but most commonly you don't. And if you have a pure virtual method in your class, it becomes an abstract class. And if it's an abstract class, that means 
you can't define an instance of it. You have to subclass it and then make an instance of the subclass. So let's go ahead and take a look at how we might do that. And then this will also introduce the, the last key capability in C++ that we're gonna focus on, which is runtime type identification. So we're gonna look at object-oriented programming, obviously, in much more detail later. But the Cliff Notes version now is we can define ourselves different subclasses or different derived classes of the stack base class. And you'll notice, by the way, that I'm still using generic programming. So generic programming and object-oriented programming are independent concepts. You can use generic programming without object-oriented programming, or at least without the, the inheritance and dynamic binding parts of object-oriented programming. You can also use object-oriented programming without requiring the use of generics. Or you can combine them together like a tasty peanut butter cup and have peanut butter and chocolate joined together in one tasty treat, which is what I'm doing here. So I'm going to define a, a V stack, which stands for vector stack, or an L stack, which stands for list stack. And these are going to be implementations we'll look at probably tomorrow that uh, implement the stack interface. And then down here, we're going to use a factory method, which is good old factory method pattern from the Gang of Four book, to make ourselves either a V stack instance or an L stack instance. But the cool part of object oriented programming is I can treat the result from make stack, this factory method, as simply a stack pointer. In this case, a stack event pointer, but it would apply to anything that we're parameterizing this with. And therefore, I can now use S, and I can go ahead and do stuff with S. I can say S arrow push, S arrow pop. And the actual decision about which method gets invoked is performed at runtime using the magic of dynamic dispatching and virtual, uh, virtual tables, virtual method tables. And we'll look at those mechanisms a bit later. The other thing I can do is once I've got myself a pointer to a base class, in this case stack, I can then go ahead and apply what's called runtime type identification to figure out what the actual derived class is, if I need it. So here you can see I have a little if statement. I say if dynamic cast L stack star S. So I'm saying if this stack pointer is really an L stack pointer, then do such and such. Otherwise, if it's a V stack pointer, do something else. And that's part of what's called runtime type identification. And we'll look at this a bit more later. Now, again, just to kind of put everything into context, these capabilities were very popular when C++ was first released, the object-oriented programming parts. Over time, they have been de-emphasized in favor of generic programming, but they still exist, of course. So that's the end of my overview of the C++ capabilities, and now I'll be happy to take any questions if you have them.